everybody. Welcome to the Fired Up with CJ show. I am so thrilled to have Robert Thurman here, who also goes by Bob and Alexander, I just found out. <laughs> Robert meaning the shining one. So I have high expectations on you right now that I you're going to be. Well, we should indeed. <laughs> indeed. It is sunshine. It is. Buddha Dharma is the sunshine. Okay, really. good. He was really the sunshine. There's yeah. No doubt about it. And also the female Buddha is even better, you know. Because in, in Buddhism, the female is associated with sun and the male with the moon. Mm, really? Know? Okay. I, yes. Uh, yeah. In Hinduism, they, they try to make the male into the sun, but they fail. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they have the idea of Shakti, you know. Yeah. Which means power, you know, and uh, and the male is kind of like reflecting there, wanly, wanly. <laughs> All right, happy birthday, by the way. So, oh, thank you. Thank 80th you. birthday. How are you feeling? Yes. I feel great. I I can't wait to be 90. What? Really, <laughs> I can't. It's, it gets better and better. All right. I, I just love it. I love being 80. You know, because you you get a little credit from people. You know, you made it 80. <laughs> I have all kind of friends that died 60, 70, like terrible. And, and when I hear somebody died at 95 or something, I think, oh, that's so young. <laughs> I am freaked out. <laughs> you actually, I was sh shocked because when I read that you were, I thought, wow, he, you, you present so much younger. And I think you know what it is? It's what? not only your, your um, looks, but also your energy. You just, when I was reading your book, I, I was thinking about our first interview and how you're so, you have so much joy in life and just, just, uh, yeah. there's laughter yeah, and I joy. Talk, that's just from my talking because I talk myself into feeling better than I really feel. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a way. So when I talk, I get li li live and deaf. Yeah, because, uh, because then, you know, it's, it's important to do it. People need to be cheered up, you know, so they don't want to. You can't cheer them up if you're moping around yourself. You know? Okay, so after the if interview, you're, you're just... myself, I can mope as much as I like. You know? <laughs> and I just do. We lost Virginia. We lost almost losing New Jersey. You know, although who lost, you know. The point is, those people in Virginia, they'll have to learn. They just have an idiot telling them what to do. You know? I know. A climate denier, someone who doesn't like to pay people money. You know, these are these terrible people that they somehow all are lying. Get them to want to elect. It's it's very discouraging. Okay, so that's really a... nice people, you know. <laughs> How do you? Okay, so today I was just sitting in in meditation, yes. and um and I, I and one of the things that you said in your book, wisdom um yes. wisdom is bliss, that was so pivotal for me. Is um you had said something about um sitting in meditation and blissing out and you're like isn't this a purpose to escape it all? And I, oh and, yeah. And, and I thought. No, then I was saying how my Mongolian teacher would chase me down in the middle of the night. He was so clairvoyant, clearly, and he would knock me out of that. You know, he would wait. He would distract me, and because that would have led to a kind of addiction, actually, mm. you know, escapist addiction. You know. Now, it's great to bliss out, but you should develop the, the difference between a Buddha and some of what, they're, what the Buddhists call the desire realm gods, because they never think that Buddhists are non-theistic. They're very theistic, mm -hmm. but they're not monotheistic. They mm -hmm. don't blame any one of them. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the difference between Buddha and the desire realm gods who really are partying. I mean, seriously, <laughs> they're really partying. It's like more than a penthouse triplex, way more. <laughs> and... Uh, but the point of difference is that a Buddha, an enlightened person, blisses out all the time. Even in hell, they bliss out. And, of course, they only go to hell to help people get out of that. Mm. But, but they, but, and so they're able to keep bliss and yet uh, empathize with others who are suffering and that way be able to help them get out of the suffering, mm. to help them find the bliss, the bliss path out of the misery. You know? So that's, that's really more fun. Because what's more fun is you don't have to then hide in some thousand-year jacuzzi or something, you know? <laughs> you know? or whatever, you know. Okay, wait. So I just want to make sure I understand this right. So you were meditating. You're getting blissed yeah. out. And then yeah. in your dreams, what happened? You just had someone like, hey. Well, not in my dreams. What no, not in my dreams. No, no I'm what, what? Really, at 20, 22, or 3, I wanted to bliss out and get away from the, the problems of a 23-year-old. 
and you know, divorcee, and I don't know what, all trying to be Buddha, a long way from there. And then my wonderful teacher, this, uh, who really looked almost like the Karate Kid's old teacher. He had a little goatee. He was Mongolian. <laughs> Mr. Miyagi? Yeah, yeah, he looked like Mr. Miyagi. He was like Mongolian, and he lived in New Jersey. And I had gone all the way to India as a beggar, as a fakir, through the, through the Iranians and the Iraqis and all yeah. the uptight people in the Middle East. And I'd gone there in Pakistan and I'd asked Indian swamis. And, and then I took a slight break for a family event. And then I met this guy in New Jersey on my way back to my return flight to Delhi after the family event. Wow. And, uh, and uh, because I planned to stay forever, you know, be a monk like, you know, like the razor's edge, like Somerset Mom or whatever. Yeah. You know, I was going to do that or, the, or like Her Herman Hesse's Siddhartha imitating that. And, uh, and there in New Jersey, I met Mr. Miyagi and he really, he said, what do you think you're going to get enlightened? That's a very difficult path. And you're running around in New York now. It is 1962, you know, and you you look like a refugee from Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> I had this long hair and a straggly beard and Afghani pants and a, a weird sheepskin jacket because I had been begging my way through the Middle East to get wow. to India. I was on pilgrimage, you know. And then I just got a I got a drive a friend of, a college friend of mine to drive me to. Uh, to um, uh, down to New Jersey to meet this guy who I thought maybe he has friends in India where I'm going back to and I'd see them. But then when I met him, I was like transfixed, mm -hmm. even though he said, oh, well, go, go, go to India, bye, you know, but uh, whatever. But he gave me a little bit of hope, but he was pretty critical of me acting like him. There were no hippies at that time, you know, but that's so why I was a pretty hippie hippie, which, they, which the people in the Middle East called me a fakir, you know, faker. Yeah. <laughs> You poser, you're a poser. Okay, so well, they at were the nice to me though because they never met an American who was a military or a spy or something. And once I was arrested in Afghanistan by some Russians and Afghanis who thought I was a spy, actually. But then, luckily, one of the Afghanis was a Yaley, and then he realized I really was a dropout from Harvard and I was really looking for enlightenment. So then he fed me a great meal. Actually, I hadn't had one for a long time, and le released me. On the way to India. Okay, so you went to, you got on a, what, exit 10 and the Garden State. You met the, you met your, your, <laughs> your llama. Yeah, and he was so fantastic. Mm -mm. When he would teach me stuff, it would, I'd just flip out. And then he kept skipping the chapters on meditation. And all I wanted was meditate because, you know, that's what people think. It's just all meditating. And then I was quickly making progress in that. And if, if progress means spacing out. Mm -hmm. You know, and feeling relief from spacing out. But he said, he did, I didn't understand for years. I was quite irritated with him. We used to argue about it. And then years later, I read something finally in a book I was translating. It said, well, it's important not to attain cessation of sensation and conception at the wrong time. Hmm. When is the wrong time? Well, I think the wrong time is before you've developed a sense of connectedness and compassion uh. because when you you have really intensified your sense of connecting to others and realizing your, your interconnectedness mm. to go into a state of complete isolation in a way mentally is like heading for psychosis you know actually really how, how so why is it like heading well, to psychosis you, you, the mind is so powerful you can create a state as if you were in a state of nothingness, like an existentialist or something. And then you, you can't stay there because it, it seems like that's the absolute to you or a state even more subtle than that. That's like sort of just a huge space and you're, it's all one, you know, but you're not really there yourself. You are the space and no one else is there to bother you. So you have a feeling of release when you enter it and so on. And then you can kind of forget that you entered it through a boundary at a moment in time so that therefore, actually, it's only a relative state. Mm. It's not the absolute. You know, it's not the final thing, and you can get stuck there. Actually, mm. in fact, mm. and um, and then in a way, your ego is sort of happy because it's sort of in command of everything. As I say, it's I call it the cheap oneness. <laughs> it's like the big oneness that is great, but actually, no one's home. 
Interesting. And it feels, but, but because you get away from the immediate problem, so you feel a uh, kind of release, like a, mm. like a little bit release. And then it's sort of boring, but you know, well, gee, that was a great release. And then you can confuse, mistake and think that's sort of everything. Mm. It would be sort of like a movie gets turned off and you're staring at the white screen. And then you wrongly think that everything is just a white screen. Mm. And you forget that it, since you're a relative being, you entered a relative state. Mm. And since it was a boundary when you weren't in it, it is only a relative state. Mm. And you and the key then is if you the key then is if you have built up ahead of time a sense of connection and you have cultivated your openness and your lovingness of the world and your appreciation of others and so on. And you sort of want to help them out. If you know if you, you have a release you want to share it sort of thing. And if you have that then then you'll kind of remember, well, I just got here, and where is here? And then you want to examine that state. And of course, anything that you examine, and you're not talking at that time. It's like you just have a momentum of examining every relative experience that you mm -hmm. have. But you're, you, you know what they call the royal reason of relativity, which means that if you're experiencing it, it's relative. Mm -hmm. If it's meaningful to you, you're relating to it. And so when you do that, this marvelous thing happens where the state of being disappeared disappears. And then guess who's there? CJ <laughs> and mom and dad and your kids and the world and the mm. terrible politicians destroying the planet and the poor animals getting extinguished and everybody's there. And then the key is, well, there, there is a possibility of a huge freedom. That's a real kind of thing. And if these people really knew about the freedom, they wouldn't be behaving like this because they would feel better. They wouldn't feel desperate. Like, poor Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. Poor guy. $200 billion. Sort of supposed to be Superman. Okay, so boom, then the rocket. 10 minutes in the rocket. Whoosh, you just like a thrill. Like he... You can go to Tony Coney Island and go on the big, the the, the cycle <laughs> for like a dollar fifty or like five dollars <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> and you can sort of leave your body and be weightless and strapped in, you know, and scared and pee in your pants or whatever, <laughs> and you have the thrill. And you know, billion he spent doing it, and and then then what? Back down to earth, and then what? He thanks everybody, and they say, well. Thanks for thanks, but how about minimum wage? Yeah. How about, you know, we, we paid for your rocket, but, you know, how about paying us? That yeah. would be thanks. Do you know what I mean? How about sharing? What to do? And then he's like a government. He has, like, more money than many countries. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, what can I do about this? And then, well, oh, well, I'm going to build a thing in space or we'll go to Mars. But what is he going to do in Mars? You know? He can go to a Quonset hut with Matt Damon and he can make french fries <laughs> by growing potatoes. That's about it. Maybe. He's going to open another Amazon there. <laughs> you saw that movie? Did you see that movie? I did see that movie. It's the saddest <laughs> movie ever. Oh, okay, well. You okay. go to Ireland and get the potatoes, you know. The okay. Incas, the potatoes are the gift of the Incas, you know. Okay, so here's the question. Okay, t okay. T today. I mean, I'm sad today. I'm, I, I was feeling... Oh, no. I'm sad today. You just, you know, yeah. the climate accord, you know, try, I mean, I'm just everything that I hear and then and then New Jersey barely making it, Virginia. Yes. And I think, yes. what is the state Crazy. of our minds? And, and, I, and I literally can feel the pain. I can feel the pain. Yeah, of course. And, it, and, it, and I, I, I do want to just bliss out. <laughs> so... So how do we hold well, these two things together? Well, you know, if you if you were saying if you if I was physically present or if I was a member of your family, which I'm not directly, but you have a dimple yeah. on your cheek. Yes. Which in our family, the people who have that when they're sad, and we have a thing we call that the the giggle point. And then okay. if we come and touch that point, they'll giggle through their tears. Because the point is, they, they, you know, it's the outside looks really bad. It has been doing so for a few years. Actually, we had, a, we thought we would go somewhere 
right away with poor Joe. But you know, he's he's a little he's he needs a little energy, you know, and something. And then they're hiding uh, uh, Kamala, who has energy. I don't know why they're bothering to hide her. That's a stupid some some yeah. stupid consultant is telling them, oh, "Don't put a woman out there." Oh, that'll freak out. Why is the people who be freaked out by that? Are the people who are just took back Virginia? Yeah. So they should put her out there, you know. And the other people will then go out in droves and outvote them. But never mind. So the point is, although you're sad, yeah, you in your heart, and in your your well, you're healthy. I can tell, and therefore your health is your bliss, hmm. your vitality, your bliss is inside the human being. That's why human being is an amazing creature. That in spite of its vulnerability and its soft skin and its no claws, you know, and no fangs except some vampires in Hollywood. And exactly. And we're, so we're very vulnerable. But in spite of that, we sort of, we, we have a sen we're sensitive and we, we enjoy and can appreciate things much more than more fierce looking animals, you know, that mm -hmm. we can. You know? And they have their own enjoyment, but not much, you know. And we have a lot. And therefore, we can also, because we can enjoy, and because we can hang out with each other, we develop language, and we can talk to each other, and then we can learn from each other, and then we can have the benefit of millions of other people's learning through, if we're through a database or a book or shake. We can read Shakespeare, which is written by a lady, by the way. There's a total foolproof theory of that, and and uh, so we can we can find that inner bliss. That we have as living, which is the nature of life, mm. and that's what my whole book is about. You know, wisdom is bliss because reality is bliss. Mm. Vitality, the force of life, is bliss, mm -hmm. and everyone is brainwashed. The Chinese people, the American people, the English people, the Indian people, everybody through this recent two thousand years of history has been brainwashed, except for a few quote unquote mystics. What only what all mystic means is the Greek word for to be hidden, hmm. and the reason they hide is because uh, the more freaked out people will, will think there's something wrong with them, they'll harm them, hmm. which they have done vastly to them, because they're happy. Hmm. Because what they're hiding is that you can be happy anyway, you know, if you understand reality, because reality, the life force is now they may call it God or they. Or they may call it Buddha, or they may call it Krishna, or they may call it something, but the, or Dharmakaya, you know, that aspect of Buddha, the sort of absolute aspect, and the, the you know, which is not, which can be female as well as male. It's not just male, not some guy only, no way. And uh, so, so that's you know, the the book is written to try to honor Buddha's attempt mm -hmm. 2,500 years ago in the middle of the militarized Indian society, where he was supposed to be a commander in chief, you know, a king. And would conquer the world, they said, right? If he if he remained king, father made a big effort to make him do that, and he he ran away and he found out a deeper reality. And then he announced, the real reality is bliss. Mm. That's the reality, nirvana. And but he was smarter than me, because he knew if he said bliss, right out to everyone, they would laugh and they would because it would be so incredible to them, because they were struggling along, you know. And the people feel, how can it be bliss? You know, like I'm a poor peasant, or I'm, I worked my thing to the bone, or the women at that time. I have just had to have 13 children, started when I was 13 years of age, when by being married off to some old, horrible person my family wanted to make a relationship with, no romance there. And, uh, you know, so they thought, how can this be bliss? You know, that's terrible, you know. And, uh, and yet, uh, he insisted on that, and he taught that, and then people madly dropped out of whatever they were forced to do, and somehow the wealth of India and the intelligence of the Indian the Sanskrit speakers and Indian people, they didn't kill him. Mm. You know, like they did Jesus, or, or like Confucius, they wouldn't give him a job, you know. He was completely untenured mm. as no <laughs> forever. He taught in his kitchen, and his poor wife had to make lunch for the students. Wow. That's all, you know, he never got it. He was kicked out because he told the Duke, don't make war on the neighbor and behave like a gentleman and be kind and blah, blah, you know, run and sure and jure and all these things, you know, ye, you know, control your ego. You know, he put a character for a king on top of the character for war, mm. you know, this I, you know, the mm -hmm. pronoun. 
So the king, the king is not on top of the wall, which could mean you should just obey the king, or it could mean you should rule your own ego mm. and not be mm. driven by it. Mm. You know, mm. one or the other. You know. So, so, so that's 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 my aim. Is wisdom is bliss. Wisdom means knowing what is real, and that's what Buddha was trying to do. And people wrongly think, oh, it's a religion. He wants us to believe something, but this is this is such cute about him. He said, well. I did discover wisdom is bliss and that reality, because reality is bliss, but unfortunately I can't really explain it to you and and I can't give it to you like a slogan that if you repeat that will give you bliss, it won't. And you, because to realize that, to experience it, to to really become sure about it, you have to go through a certain process of learning and also unlearning being critical about some, some things you're told you know, that you need the king or you'll be really miserable because the enemy will get you. Or you need guns because the animal will eat you and so on. Actually, some animals will eat you. But, you know, you can, you learn, you learn, we humans know how to defend themselves very well. They're more violent than any animal when, once they get organized. Right. You know, so, so, uh, so the point is we're taught to be afraid of reality. Mm. And therefore, we have the slogan, ignorance is bliss. So mm. I just dared to counteract that slogan. It's not so obvious because my editor wouldn't let me say wisdom is the bliss. Mm. Like, you know, ignorance is the bliss. I wanted to say, well, actually, wisdom is the bliss, the opposite mm. of ignorance. Mm-hmm. But they wouldn't let me say that. Because, and I, I'm glad, actually. I think they were right. They're always right, you know. <laughs> They're professional. <laughs> they are. They're pros. They know, like, what, how it will hit the people, you know. But it's a little daring of me, but I am 80, you know, that's why I, I like it. And then later, Buddha did say, he, he only said it was the end of suffering. And then people wrongly misunderstood it to think, oh, because we, we know how life is suffering, it's the end of life. But that's yeah. totally wrong. That, it was the opposite as to really being alive without suffering. Mm-hmm. That's the way to really be alive. Now, have you ever had a, a kind of ecstatic uh, experience where you then stubbed your toe in the middle of it or something, you were feeling so cheery, and you kind of didn't really bother you too much, but it was sore later. Yeah, I've had stuff like that, yes. Yeah, so so that that shows that by that smaller experience that there could be a kind of total bliss a way of connecting to the world that empathy for those who really are suffering would mar it because they're suffering it. But it would be so strong that you wouldn't be dragged into their suffering, even mm. though you're fully aware of it. Mm. You know, it's like it's like you are being when you're a Buddha is defined as a being who empathizes with everyone. Mm-hmm. Like you empathize with your kids, right? You love them. I love mine. And everybody does. And if they if they're something hurts them, it's like ah, it's like I practically feel it myself, you know, when they you know I have to take them to the emergency room. But it's in that stitch or something, you know. It's yeah. like, oh, we all we all did that with our kids. Yeah. And but but then and we're able to do that. But so human being is. So that means that when we only narrowly identify with ourselves, if we, we have develop a very selfish habit, a way of being, then that's just a, we're we're constructing ourselves like that, mm-hmm. because since we're capable of expanding that sense of identification, and you know, people on teams, even people in a war on a platoon, they do that or. Mob, mob awareness, is, which is, can be bad as well as good, people can identify. So Buddha is defined as someone who would identify with everybody. Totally. Yeah, but which that kind of sucks. <laughs> it sucks to identify with everyone. What's Inconceivable. What's good about identifying with everyone? Well, you wouldn't harm anyone. Well, oh. Never. You would be a being who would be and and because you you couldn't do that without a bliss that was so huge, it was almost beyond your body. Mm-hmm. So you would have to find that bliss in the core of everything, sort of thing. So it's like a doctor who sees a patient with a serious symptom, and they don't suddenly feel pain in their breast or their heart mm-hmm. or their whatever, wherever the tumor is or whatever it is that's a problem. But they, they kind of empathize with it from knowledge. Mm. And then they know where to put their surgery or what to do, you know. But they do that without getting freaked out. In other words, they mm. don't get, they don't, 
they are, but yet they're very sensitive when they sew that thing, sew that blood vessel to that stent or whatever they're doing after the, or bypass or whatever. So they're very cool. They saw through the breastbone, <laughs> from the open. and then they, but then they're very delicate about sewing the thing, you know, mm. and uh, which is why there should be more women surgeons because they are more mm. better at sewing and mm -hmm. they have more delicate awareness in their fingertips, definitely. Yeah, but but uh, so so it's a you know it's a, it's kind of an unbelievable ideal, which is why Buddha said that I can't really explain it to you in the sense of you just believe that that's there you won't be able to because it seems so completely huge, mm. you know. But on the other hand, I have to say it's a little preferable to the idea of an omnipotent deity because the Buddha never says he's omnipotent, mm -hmm. and the problem with omnipotent deity who's the loving deity, supposedly, is that what's his excuse for when we're really miserable? What, what's his problem? <laughs> what, you know, Job, what is this game with Satan about Job? Yeah. Boils and children dying. and I mean, what is that? What sort of weirdo is, is, is he? That's too weird. But, you know, it's not that me, I'm saying that, to be critical. Mystics can find God and they go beyond the sort of literalistic projection of what God is in, in the monotheistic traditions. Great mm -hmm. mystics, you know, John of the Cross, Trace of Avila, they, they, they can get there that way. But the masses are live in terror because subconsciously, they be like, oh, I love God. Oh, I love God. I love your neighbor. I love that guy. Oh, but then my kids just got run over by a truck. Then, they, then there's automatically suspicion, like Elie Wiesel hating God after being in Auschwitz, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And he was a pious, faithful monotheist. Mm -hmm. But then, after seeing what was going on in Auschwitz, he, he he didn't forgive him till twenty eight, two thousand and seven. Mm. In the New York op-ed, he forgave God. Mm -hmm. He decided maybe there was a purpose, mm -hmm. but he didn't really no because there's no purpose. Okay, you know? I want to hear about your personal journey through All navigating right. this bliss. Like you know, so yeah. where did you start, and and where are you now, and what are the little ups and downs of your journey as you've learned to navigate yeah. bliss yourself. Well, well, you know, I I had a midlife crisis at 20 hmm. because I lost an eye. Hmm. And that's a good time to have a midlife crisis at 20 <laughs> because you can still learn something, hmm. you know. I mean, it was a sad side because I was married. I had a daughter with my lovely wife, first wife, and I wanted her to go with me with the daughter. We had money and uh, already, you know, and we would go to India and find a guru because I realized Harvard was not teaching me to be enlightened. Mm. And I was reading things outside the curriculum. There wasn't much Buddhist studies at that time or anything like that, and there were no Buddhist centers, and there was, there was a few esoteric things, but not much. And... Uh, so I said, we got to go there, you know. Now, I, you know, like what I would have said maybe at 40 after I'd been like a banker or whatever I would have been, uh, you know, some business person or some diplomat maybe. I was kind of interested in that. And, uh, and then freaked out at 40. Well, no, that's no good. I have to be enlightened because anything you try to do to fix the world, it's going to be, you know, a bit hit or miss. You know, you can, you can help, but then it, there, will, there will be collateral damage always. Uh, mm -hmm. It's always the case. In the past, I think we might be coming to a new era, personally, mm -hmm. which will be really wonderful, actually. Although we'll still die. But actually, I think there's a way we can learn to die where it won't be a bother. Mm -hmm. And we'll have, because, because nobody stays dead. We'll, we, it, it could be a generally learned thing that death is a way of getting more alive. I'm, I think we're getting mm -hmm. there. I do. You mean a goic death, or what kind of death are you no, referring to? No, not to seek it, because human life is so precious. Right. If you would prolong that as long as possible, and fight death, fight death. But on the other hand, understand death as the moment when your connection to the vastness of the life force, of the bliss, of the bliss reality, is too much for whatever is left of your body, mm. either accident or old age or whatever it may be. You know. That's 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 bothering your body, you know, and the body can't is no longer a useful vehicle for that bigger force. And that when you are able to open to that bigger force in the after death moment, then you can find a better body because you can maybe find a nicer mom and a decent dad 
in a place where you'll be able to develop more as a mystic or as an enlightened person, be more helpful, be kind, maybe be a good president hmm. of the of the, of a of a of a democratic, you know, liberal country. Maybe be a a good emperor even in case of a like there were some good emperors in Chinese hmm. history in Asia. There were occasionally some really good ones. And, uh, you know, they have that in, Ch in classical Chinese, you know, they have one pronoun for the self called Chen, mm -hmm. if I remember rightly, the tone even Chen, mm -hmm. which is the most humble possible pronoun. It's made up of characters of sort of humility. And, but, and only the emperor can use that pronoun uh, based himself uh, to that degree of being through an awareness of being the servant, actually, of all of his subjects, you know, mm. and being the minister of heaven, you know, they, which mm. was all the ancestors, you know, mm. they didn't have quite the same kind of creator. They had the idea that all the ancestors collectively would give the Tian Ming, mm. the mandate of heaven to a being who would be really selflessly, who would face south mm. and everything would work out well, you know, mm. unlike, unlike us nowadays, face south and all you see is red states. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. But, you know, we're getting past that. Yeah, so you went to so, India. So, you went to India yeah, in so your twenties. You had your then midlife then crisis. Midlife. So then I went to India. Then I got back to New Jersey. Then, and my 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 beloved first wife, she wouldn't go. She freaked out. They thought I was crazy. I was having you know PTSD about losing my eye and all that. Yeah. And, you know, which maybe I was to some extent. But on the other hand, I definitely wanted to make life count because that kind of an accident, although it wasn't that painful actually, but it's just so it changes your orientation in such a way that you sort of realize the, the value of life and you kind of have an awareness of death, which makes you want to be more alive mm -hmm. and you want to really make life count. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of could see, probably from my former life awarenesses, I could see that whatever profession I did, whatever I did with the family would be sort of imperfect because I'm imperfect. And so I wanted to be more, not maybe not totally perfect, but better. And, the, and, the, and what, I, what I said at the time was, India, I can feel sure, has some sort of yoga of the emotions. Hmm. Not just the yoga of the body. But yoga was not a big deal in those days. But not just the yoga of the body and not just some sort of theory of psychology and maybe money enough to go to a shrink. But a yoga where you can learn to manage your own emotional energy mm -hmm. in such a way as to avoid the negative types of emotions mm -hmm. and reinforce the positive ones to be a really positive person. And so that was my aim, you know. So anyway, I did that. And then I met uh, Mr. Piyagi. Thank you for the name. I forgot that. <laughs> Mr. Piyagi, Geshe Wangyal, Danjile del Tenimete. I met him and he helped me so much. And then, but then I was being stubborn, of course, still. And I wanted to be a monk because I wanted a lifelong fellowship, kind of in the Buddhist culture to be a monk is beyond fellowship for life. You know? wow. Free lunch. Free lunch, right? <laughs> not noticing or thinking that America doesn't allow free lunch. Protestant ethic, you know, no free lunch. So, but I, I was determined. So then finally he got bored with me, did, bugging him to make me a monk. And then he took me after a couple of years of study to the Dalai Lama. And he said, well, the refugee community there in North India is sort of like a little bit of Tibet. And maybe they'll make you a monk because they love making monks. I mean, they think monks is just the greatest thing. And it's easy to do, and they're happy to feed them, even their refugees. And so I did that. And uh, although he then annoyed me when he dropped me off, Mr. Miyagi, because he told the Dalai Lama he really wants to be a monk. He's really sincere. He already speaks Tibetan fluently. But don't make him. He wants to be a monk, but don't make him a monk. <laughs> He's not going to be able to stay as a monk. He's an American. He just can't stay as a monk. And the Dalai oh, okay, I'll take that under advisement. And so he delayed a little bit, but then he did make me a monk. So then, so then uh, I didn't last too long. Back in America, there was no monastery, really. There was only ethnic monasteries. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a Mongolian, and I wasn't a Tibetan from in a refugee community, you know. And then even with the ones in Dharamsala who loved that I loved the Dharma and Buddhism, and they were amazed at this sort of white-looking, weird face, you know, with the blue eye. Uh, could speak so perfectly with their, mm. because I was very good with accents. My, my mm. father was a linguist. I, I was not mm. really good at that. And uh, and they, they enjoyed that, but then they were looking at me like, well, we're refugees. Where's his Jeep? Where's his foundation? Where's his gun and his tank, you know, to go get our country back? You know, where is he? You know what I mean? <laughs> they were like, I could, I could read their mind after a while, you know. <laughs> 
it was a little bit that, so I couldn't really feel I should live off them. Right. Their, own, their own thing had shattered, but they, they kept it together nicely, and they, they do have a few Western monks nowadays, but at that time, nobody else. And uh, so then I'm back in the States, and nobody, and then we had the Vietnam War protests, and we had all my peers were doing that, and they were doing the marches at Selma, you know, and the racial thing, you know, and the whole human rights, and and then, and I had this a little bit activist thing about me. So then I would go out and march like a monk, and uh, like one of those Vietnamese monks, you know. And then and then the, my then Mr. Miyagi said, "You can't do that. If you're going to go marching, you we're not really. This is not a Buddhist country. We're kind of an exotic thing here in this ethnic place." Of Mongolians and Tibetans, and therefore we can't have a white guy going out there and acting like we're going to go against the, the culture. Oh, interesting. You know? And he said, you, "So if you want to do that, you just have to go out and take care of yourself somewhere. And then to be a monk in a rented room or something, or your mother's house or apartment, or whatever, because right. I had no money, you know, it was not possible. So I, I soon realized it was not possible, and I'd have to make my contribution." By being a layman. So then I realized, well, I better go back to school. What I can do is get a PhD. I can study for a change and uh, study the regular course and get a PhD. And then I can teach. And then in that process, I'll study more and I can mm. try to practice as a layman, you know, which was what he intended. My doctor, Mr. Miyagi, wanted me to do that from the beginning. He was right. So I, and I, but in the Tibetan culture, that's a big embarrassment because you go monk for life. It's not like Thailand, uh, you know. Yeah. You asked for life for that. You took that for life. So then, it, but what I'm so happy recently, the Dalai Lama, on a video, meant talking about me. He said he was giggling about how much he know he knew for sure how much I appreciated the Tibetan Buddhist culture, and then he said, even when he was younger, he went around dressing up like a monk, <laughs> and people thought, oh, is he being a little rude? You were an actual monk for a while. And I said, no, no, that's so great. You don't understand. Because he's sort of ignoring the embarrassment, you see. He's just saying I was dressing up, you know. Oh, uh, you're pretending to be. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You're not a your monk poser. <laughs> exactly, because it wasn't really possible. He was, he was sort of subconsciously or subliminally, you know, he, was, he so naturally always does the nice things. He's so nice. And uh, he mm. was being like that. Wow. And... Um, and uh, anyway, so so so, and he wrote me a letter on my 80th birthday because we've known each other for he said almost six decades. Wow! And that letter was so sweet. He said, he said, it's so nice that you are working hard still at 80 years old, and you're inspiring lots of people. He said that's really nice. And then he said this one sentence that I thought was so marvelous. He said, I too, he said, am in good health and full of joy. He said. At 86. Mm. And I'm able to do that. What what makes you able to be at that age in good health and full of joy is altruism. Mm. Trying to use your life to serve others. That's what makes it possible. Yeah. So he was kind of inviting me at least to make it the next six years. And also encouraging <laughs> me to try to remain in service. You know, wow. people, you know? Yeah. I was so touched. I was really touched by that. Yeah. So kind. He doesn't write people personal letters. The secretary, <laughs> the secretary said, will tell you. Yeah. He, he said greetings. You know, no, they will. He he will tell lots of people. He has lots of friends. He'll say, secretary will say, oh, it's all this all about you the other day, and he wishes you this or that. You know, he'll say that. But he actually wrote me that letter, and I was just, I was floored, flabbergasted. Yeah. I can and, feel uh, it. I can feel it. <laughs> Now you're making me cry. Well, now, you have to tell me, now, now you have to tell me your story. Oh, no. You are C.J. Lou. Oh, you uh, me. Uh, and which kind of flower is it, or moonlight, or in the standing? What is Lou? I don't know the word. Know, it's, um, it's willow tree. Willow tree. I knew it was something great. And then, then you have, and you, w w how did you get interested in these spiritual things to do a podcast like this? Um, <laughs> like this? I might, you know what? It's, it's exactly that what you said, my dad died. And so it was death. Oh. So, you know, my dad dying at a, you know, relatively early age, like 33. Oh, and and no. he was, he was my, um, he was my deep love. So when he died, it really um, made me f really think about life way more carefully. Sure. 
And so that kind of kicked off my path along with my kids and trying to figure out. You already almost, had kids by that time? Um, no, right after he died, um, a, a year uh, and a half later, I got married, then had kids. And you married Mr. Miyagi? No. <laughs> Actually, if you met my husband, he's he's a, a nice Jewish guy, but he actually he's the sweetest, most wonderful man well, Jewish ever. Jewish people are very sweet. He's very know? sweet. You know, they're amazing. You know, guess who was Jewish? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Why don't those Christians get that through their head? Jesus was Jewish. Whoops. 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 What is all this centuries of anti-Semitism? What is that? I know. The, the, the Savior was Jewish. I know. People who refer to him, they, when they said teacher to him, they say Rabbi. That's what they said. Yeah. The great rabbi. I mean, maybe he's the son of God, too. I don't care. The point is, he chose to be. If he was son of God, he made it on purpose. He chose Mary and Joseph, man, and they were Jewish. Yeah. So they're very sweet. So anyway, okay, so you married him. And yeah, then so I mean, well, then I had kids, and then I've been just, you know, all those metaphysical questions. Who am I? What's my life yes. here? And why am I here? Yes. And yes. and then um, I feel like um, I've been on a journey since 33, so I've been on a journey for the last 20 five years. Oh, you mean about... you were 33 when your dad died? Not your dad was 30. Yeah, oh, no, I was, God. yeah. He was about 50, 60 or Yeah, something. yeah, he was 60, oh, okay, 68. Okay. I but was still. Really yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, so okay. I, yeah, anyhow, so I. So do, you, do you meditate a lot? Yeah, and I mean, my current meditations are sitting and tuning into, actually, my previous meditations recently have been blissing out and just up going into cessation. And then um, recent, yeah. and then recently, <laughs> recently I've been just sitting there crying and getting angry and having no and feeling stuff that maybe me, maybe other people. I frankly don't even know. It's it's like I'm actually having a pretty good day, and then I'm yes. crying and I don't even know what it's about. So because you're, you're an immensely compassionate person. That's why maybe so I don't. You're know. crying. Yeah. Did you ever read Shanti Deva's book? No. Which called one? Called the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. Okay, <laughs> I'll read it. And uh, and uh, that's a really really helpful and important book. And in his sixth chapter, he talks about the futility of anger, and even in, even when you're being harmed or when the somebody else is being, and and how. On the other hand, doesn't mean you can't resist harm. But you can do it much better when you, before you get angry, you know, when you, you know, he has the beautiful teaching there about how the fuel of anger is a feeling of mental discomfort, hmm. you know, where something's grating on you like some idiot, you know, it's like you're in a blind date and the guy turns out to be a Republican and a QAnon conspiracy theorist and a complete ass and he's in denial of, of climate change, etc. And when he walks up to the door when you were younger, uh, before you were married, and he was younger, walks up to the door, and you, you see the way he's dressed and the whole thing, and you just your intuition tells you, this is not going to be fun. <laughs> but do you, do you act on that? And say, oh, I'm so sorry, I have a headache, goodbye. Yeah. No, you go out, and then you get more and more and more annoyed, and finally you come home steaming from having to listen to a bunch of idiocy. And so the, the key thing is, is to be of good cheer. Actually, Jesus, that was one of Jesus' great statements to people, were to be of good cheer, he always said. And that's the Shanti Deva teaches that. And what that means is, well, when you first saw him, you were fairly cheerful. And say he was dressed like a typical Republican, <laughs> trying to look like, uh, like he was a military cadet or something, or football team man or whatever, looking all uptight. And, uh, you, know, gr you know, grinding his teeth into the jaw muscle with, Funny like this and his nervousness, you know, all this body language that shows you he's a completely uptight person. And so, and so then you then you could say, oh, you know, oh, I have such a headache. Oh, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. Apologize. Did you take a cab here? Can I reimburse your cab? Please just go home. I think it's, it won't work today. You know, and uh, let's call. Let's think about it later. You know, so, in other words, avoid. Or my wife is very good at this. It's like. It's like cheerful rudeness. 
Yeah. Like, and I'll give you my favorite example. She doesn't like me saying anything about her, but my favorite example is I come home from the office, academic office, you know, department, some, some stupid thing going on. I'm very riled up. Do you know what just happened? You know, somebody, one of my arch foes in the academia or something like that, saying, and she looks at me, kids are running around like 5 30, 4 30, 5 6 30. She says, Well, why don't you just shut up about it before we're both mad about it? <laughs> <laughs> she says, Then tell me later. That's not cheerful. <laughs> And then when, when I first encountered that, this is my se our second long 53-year wife, who's my guru. She's yeah. my Mr. Miyagi now. Oh, definitely. She's my guru. But because women are smarter about these things, they're more connected naturally than the men. Men are like, eh, where am I? Where am I going? Where? You know, <laughs> better, let's go somewhere. You know, like really out of it. Whereas women are like, oh, where are we? And who's where and what? You know, because they're connected to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then first I was like, what, you're not going to listen to me? I'm not going to share my anguish. And, and you know, I did, tried that a little bit. Well, no, I mean, why don't you talk to your kids? Like, bring it, or tell me later, you know. <laughs> Sit down, like, be cool, you know. Like, and then uh, and finally <laughs> I realized that was really smart. Yeah. Of course, because then later it would have a different impact. Wouldn't be dealing with that kind of emotion. Wouldn't be dumping that emotion on the, to the whole then the dog will get nervous and bark at me or something. You know, I go, you know what they did? If you realize reality is bliss, it wants you to be happy and you'll get over the, what Wilhelm Reich called the emotional plague. Hmm. You know, which is people who can't feel streaming inside their own system, which is why you, C.J. Lou, you are a happy person, I can tell. you, <laughs> Not just the dimple. It's just the fact that you're even talking to me. You know you wouldn't even want to talk to me. Like, who is this idiot? Wisdom is bliss. What is he talking about? <laughs> he must be. He must be like I don't know what an independent or something. You You're know? actually unbelievably delightful. I wish I could just hit play all the time and just listen to you speak. You're just so. Uh, right. you're, well, you know, you you're would so like. Funny. You would like. You know, if you read Shanti Deva, in my book, Infinite Life. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very, it's like a commentary on it, but it's not a word by word commentary, but it's like a commentary trying to put Shantideva's profound uh, emotional yogas, mm. you know, about meditating, compassion, and about first overcoming anger, mm. you know, and realizing how anger is a poison. Mm. And if people who hurt you are actually doing so probably because they are driven by anger, probably. Mm -hmm. And they, and, 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 and you can you can get rid of them much better when you're happy mm. and more cheery, and then there'll be less blowback mm. from them. Because they can feel that you're not actually hating them; you just don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, you just get out of my face, you know, yeah. or you're running away with it in a jolly manner, and they can tell subconsciously, mm. you know, mm. that you're against them and you're going to do everything you can to stop them, but not you don't want to. It's because they're behaving badly, and you don't actually hate them as a human being. They can feel it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you feel free. You know, it's like forgiving people. You know, forgiving doesn't do anything for the murderer. They're still a little guilt-stricken and horrible. Really, it really doesn't matter to them. But what matters is the person who forgives. That's the closure. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I realize you were acting demented when you killed my friend, my brother, my sister, whatever it was. Those people who think by seeing someone executed, they're going to be like, oh, I'll be so happy. They're not. You know, I used to meet with people at the bar who were against capital punishment, which is usually expensive waste of time. And the people who see the person being killed, the dead man walking, so to speak, that doesn't give them any closure at all. They're not satisfied. It doesn't bring back their their relative, you know, or whoever it was, you know, and it's useless. And then they just feel kind of this weird taste, you know, and then they they feel guilty in a way that they took such kind of certain type of supposed pleasure out of it, but actually it's not a pleasure to mm. see somebody like, ah, that's not pleasant. Mm. It's, not, it's, it's not really pleasant. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So anyway, so wisdom is bliss. You know, I'm, I was usually I'm talking too much. Wisdom is bliss. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Beth told me I better shut myself up and hold it up. You did that already. <laughs> I did. I want people to read it because I want them to cheer up. And and in there is a lot of ethics about how to stand up against nasty people and this and that. 
And then also about me, you know, because you said you want to hear about me. That's where my consolation prize comes in. Because when, when, when I teach uh, the Buddha Dharma, in a, especially in a non-academic setting, where I'm, I'm trying to help people with it, there's two main points I make. One, I don't, I'm not trying to make them Buddhists. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to be Buddhists. I follow Dalai Lama's rule, and I do it sincerely. For the last 30 years, for the first 20 years of knowing him, I thought it was a strategy, and I wasn't really sincere about it, because I felt such a gratitude to the Buddhist uh, yogas, let's say. You know, I felt so much better, you know. I understood things better. And, uh, but then in the last 30, 40 years, I, I really am on his bandwagon, which is everyone should keep their grandmother's religion. Mm. Because otherwise, she'll be unhappy. Mm. And you can find, and if you learn about how to manage your emotions and things from any other one in case they had more techniques that were useful, like meditation techniques. Christian monks had meditation techniques. Mm. The Protestants trashed the monasteries, is what we don't realize, in, in no free lunch America. Because, you know, those those barons and those Henry VIII wanted to divorce, you know, so they didn't want the Catholics, you know, they didn't want they didn't want monasteries. And also the monasteries had created great wealth and those lords wanted that wealth. And also they wanted all the manpower and the woman power to work for them. Mm -hmm. They didn't want people dropping out and be holy, you know. Uh, and so then they put us into this busy, busy overproduction uh, culture of ours, you know, ruining, ruining the planet, actually. And. Uh, so, I don't know, I forgot what I was Your consolation about. prize at the oh, end of the yeah, book yeah, yeah. So, is... So when I do it, when I do it, then people say, well, well, gee, you must be enlightened, you know? And then I, I always say, no way, really I'm just as miserable as you. It's just when I talk about it, I cheer up. I say like that. And then my wife has been scolding me lately. Stop doing that. That's too discouraging. Besides, it's not really true. Because you actually are much happier, hmm. and you're you're not perfect. No way. If you said you were enlightened like a Buddha, I would probably kick you out of the house. <laughs> but 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 you know you're more enlightened for sure. Mm -hmm. And so you shouldn't deny people feeling there's some example that mm. they might get a benefit from thinking through these things and learning them, not becoming Buddhist. That's not the goal. Because Grandma will be really unhappy if they don't go to the synagogue or the temple or the church or the or the whatever it is, wherever she goes. But she'll be really happy if they're nicer in the church or in the synagogue mm. or in the whatever, you know, because they learn some way of managing their mind. Mm. And they're happier. She'll be really happy when you're happier. Mm. So that's, that's the goal. That's point one. And then two, the consolation prize is this. Although I'm not enlightened, I know enough about it, and I've tasted the direction mm. so that I'm sure I will be. I have like a real deep faith that I will become enlightened at mm. some point, maybe seven more lifetimes, <laughs> maybe three, maybe the next one. Who knows? On this yeah, planet, 25 more years. You got to uh, get whatever. going. Oh, it could be. It could be if necessary, if that was helpful. And, and because of that, I then realized something from Buddha's story. Mm. I don't know if you know the story well enough to know that before he attained nirvana under the tree there, he had a thing where his memory suddenly opened up and he realized that beginninglessly he had been every single kind of being beginningless infinite times. Mm. In other words, he remembered a vast ocean of previous lives. And then <clears throat> that was the first thing that happened to him, which you'd mm. think might be a bit of a freak out. But mm. he, he was able to have that memory. And then the second thing he had was he then saw all other beings and how they also had this is huge path, mm -hmm. and then then he saw all their potential futures. He sort of understood the process of their evolution, and so then the third one, where he felt released, was in a sense of being connected to all of them, because he realized everyone had been his mother in some lifetime, everyone had been his father in some lifetime. They'd also been his enemies, because once it's infinite and it's beginningless, it's every possible combination. Mm -hmm. But the good ones had been done many times by everyone. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted them all to be free of mm -hmm. suffering. He didn't want to go and <laughs> be, be a bad mom to them or have them be a bad mom to him because some of them had been bad moms probably, not so good ones, or bad dads or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So, so his nirvana then was comprehensive. They, they, they don't really say that because in the story they're not pushing people sort of beyond where they can be 
feel it's credible. They're allowing people to think, well, he sort of escaped from suffering. Nirvana was a cessation. And it didn't involve this immense, vast interconnectedness. Oh, wow. But in fact, it does. And so its wisdom becomes compassion. You know? Yeah. And but you're so con- my, yes. my consolation is that although I'm not feeling like this is Nirvana talking to C.J. Lu, quite. I almost do, actually, because I think you're really great. But it's not quite. And, but when I get enlightened, because the Buddha, it becomes spread out, not just through all space, mm. but all time. Mm. So then I will revise my experience of this moment with mm. you. And I will realize we were already frolicking around in Nirvana. Yeah. Whatever people say. What, <laughs> we'll be in Nirvana retroactively. I didn't get to be a light in this life. So, you know, you know, rainbow lights don't come out of my ears at will. You know, right. I can see rainbow lights occasionally, but they don't just, I can't turn them on. I can't just put the tap on, you know, to make someone else cheer up, you know, or whatever, which is what Buddhists can do that. They, they can really, they, they, can do, they, they do performance art, special effects. They can they turn their turn into rainbow light when they die. Or you're saying even when they're oh, alive. They do that. And that's considered a big deal. The rainbow body, they go on about that. But a Buddha, a, a working Buddha, before teaching something to get people's attention or something, they can make a rainbow just pop out. They have, they have a little tuft of hair, of whitish hair in the third eye spot. And, uh, and that looks like a transistor. And then that can, that can emanate like a rainbow. And everybody will suddenly see all these rainbows and glitter, glitter, like glitterata, like a glitter, gl- you know, glitter. Right. Well, they, you just read the sutras. If you read Buddha Sutra, they all translate it in Chinese. Uh, and they in Sanskrit and there's enough in English now. Have what you seen special? such a thing? Have you actually seen a rainbow coming from someone's third well, eye? Well, sort of, sort of, but maybe a more in a dream because I was unable to see it. Wow. But I didn't meet Shakyamuni Buddha. That's like a full-scale working Buddha. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, the, the, the Buddhists have this weird idea that although the Buddha doesn't create the world, he's not a monotheistic creator. In fact, even Brahma or the, or Yahweh is not a creator because you can't blame any one person for the whole thing. We all do it together, kind of, you know. We're all intercreating constantly. And, but but that, that becoming that sort of being is immensely powerful to shift things in a good direction. Mm. Unfortunately, can't just blast people with bliss and make them enlightened. Can't or would have. Do you know what I mean? So it's right. not omnipotent. <laughs> but, but it's very good at staging the system and the situation and landscaping and you know, et cetera, and creating special things and like Star Trek. You know? Yeah, it's like a special it's, effect to get yeah, capture your attention so that you Star believe. Trek, like, yeah. In Star Trek, right, they have this, what's it called? The, not the synthesizer room, it's the simulation room. What's it called? The, you know, where they go in and. Yeah, the simulation see, room where they have like yeah, a pretend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Buddha can do that for people and help them learn something through that. He's wow. able to do that. They say, they say, they, they claim. You know, I. Maybe maybe I have been in one, but I I wouldn't know you see because I'm my still my perception is too crude. But, I don't know uh, about that. You still got twenty five good years of your life to keep well, on I'm going. Dalai Lama ordered me twenty four. Twenty <laughs> four. <laughs> well, because the only reason he did that, he wouldn't be mean like that in case I'm all broken down eventually. But uh, I tricked him in a conversation because I know that there's a prophecy. That he can live to 100, actually originally 120, wow. if necessary. And then lately, the one that's circulating is 113. Wow. And, um, and so in a conversation, I was teasing him a little bit. You know, it, was, it was off camera. You know, it was not, uh, yeah. And uh, it was off record. But I was saying, Your Holiness, you constantly, people, these journalists come to you, are you the last Dalai Lama? You know? And the CCP, Politburo is always trying to promote gossip that you're going to croak at any minute. Oh, no. If they hope so, you know. God. they being so silly. Yeah. You could cheer them up a lot, but they just are, are stubborn about it. Big hug to you. I, if you were oh, there, I would yeah. just give you a yeah. huge hug. Yeah. <laughs> I actually yeah. adore you. You, you. I completely adore you. And um, if well, you ever I, come I, in I, Seattle. You're, really? You're wonderful. It's so nice of you to circle back. We've been talking to Robert Thurman, Wisdom is Bliss, four friendly fun facts that can change your life. 
Thank you so much. Okay.